Hey guys, welcome back to our restoration project. So today in Las Vegas, lots of rain, lots of thunder, and monsoons rolling through. So I think it's perfect day to make a video. So today we're gonna to do kind of a final walk around and talk about panel gaps, uh, look at some of the final details on this car. We haven't really had a chance to go over the whole thing as a complete unit, so this is gonna be that opportunity. Um, from here going forward, it's gonna be all engine and engine related components. Uh, the last time we did a video was on this fast the door here. We had all kinds of issues on this thing. We finally got it resolved. Uh, so we'll take a look at that and see exactly what it took to get that worked out. Setting your panel gaps on these cars are rough. I'm not going to kid you. I spent weeks in here dialing this thing in, getting our big gaps worked out with our fender gaps, door gaps. Uh, so what I'm going to try to do is give a basic outline of how to align everything as a group. So really on these cars, um, you can't really just adjust the door and that's going to work out. You really got to adjust everything together. So the hood relates to the fender, which relates to the door, which relates to the, the door jam, and so on. So you got to take it all into consideration. We're going to go over that. Also, we're going to do an update on uh, cooling the fuel lines. We're going to stay tuned for that. So some safety issues there uh, that we want to bring up uh, FYI. Also, I want to thank everyone for their well wishes and support for my dad. He has recovered 100% and is uh, back to his old self. He's walking around and driving around and hopefully uh, someday soon we'll get back in the booth here and help us out with our call. So let's get started first by taking a look at this passenger door and see what we did to get it to work out. Okay, let's take a look and see exactly what was going on in here. So the problem I had was this inner door felt um, and just not being able to seat the garnish rail down into the door the way it was supposed to. So it was hanging up a little bit high on this end here um, and wasn't able to seat it. Also it was binding on the window, uh, too much thickness there as we try to roll the window up and down. And let's see, we roll it up and down, it's no problem at all. Um, so let's put a clip in here and I'll show you exactly what I did to resolve it. Okay, so let's try and explain exactly what's going on here with our inner and outer door felts and see what the problem is with our garnish rail and why I can't get the passenger side to work. So this is the felt that I was trying to press in there. Um, and this is the new replacement that Porsche supplies. And uh, this is spec'd out for a few different models. So it's just kind of a general fitment, but uh, on this early garnish rail, uh, it doesn't really work that well. We did get away with it on the uh, driver's side door and it worked just fine there, but there just seems to be just enough difference between the driver's side and passenger well, we can't use that. It's just too much buildup. Things are hitting and rubbing, and uh, I can't get it pressed in. So uh, what I've decided to do was go back to the original. Uh, so what I have here is a restored original. Uh, basically just dry cleaned it and uh, painted it. As you can see, the condition uh, is a little bit weathered. This side here was from the driver's side, and as you can see, you can't really reuse that one. It's just too broken up, but uh, the passenger side, luckily for us, was still in really good shape. So we just tuned it up and painted it, masked and painted with this classic coat, which uh, seems to work really well for what we're doing with this piece. Um, the other alternative you could try is, uh, this is the outer door felt that they spec out for the car, comes with and without clips. So you could try and uh, fix an outer felt. This is slimmer in profile here to the inside. Uh, if you could get it to stay down and stay put, uh, that would be another thing you could try to do. Or you could just try and uh, find a good used original to get you through the situation. Anyways, that's the uh, issues we're going to have here with our door felts. Uh, I'm just switching back to our original for the passenger side. Uh, we'll have to go with that for now until Porsche comes out with something uh, a little bit more suitable for the early cars. So luckily we still had one inner door felt in pretty good shape, so we're able to get through this with no issues. So here's our finished door and painted edge on there, and that's the way that turned out. Really, really happy with the way everything closes, uh, all the windows function, everything is working 100% uh, the way it should. I'm looking at our inner jam there, dashboard all finished up seats in place and then also uh, if you saw our previous video on uh, seat belts you would see that I actually had the badge uh, pointing in the wrong direction we've got that corrected and uh, now that is in the correct position there 
And then one other thing we were finally able to round up, uh, thanks to our friends at Ein Meilig, uh, they have some seat buffers that uh, work with our hinge there. Let me pull this open and see if we can see how that works. So there's our new seat buffers. They had just a handful of these left in stock. So that's actually what needs to happen as our hinge comes down and seats itself onto that tab. Yeah, while well, we got the seat forward, let's take a look at the upholstery work from our friends at Otters International, which was just huge help on the restoration on this car. Just beautiful work coming out of their shop. And uh, really easy to work with. You know, if you want to do this yourself, uh, they can set you up with the kits, or you can have them do it. Uh, but just beautiful workmanship and very high quality materials and correct materials. Looking up into our headliner. And then all our seat hardware working out the way it should. So I'm very happy with the way everything has finally come together uh, as far as fit and finish on this project. A lot of, a lot of wrestling with it just to get it to, to do what you want. You would think it would be a little bit more forgiving uh, than it has been. <laughs> but really, uh, the Germans, they just got everything so exact that if you don't land it exactly where it needs to be, uh, you'll just end up wrestling with it. They really were just incredible engineers and craftsmen that many years ago. And then having a look at our dashboard. And then a close-up look at our glove box opened up here. You can see all the different materials and different mediums they use to finish this out. And then I'd like to share with you guys uh, just my opinion uh, of working with this project for five years. So I've had everything apart. I've looked at everything of as close as you can look at it. And uh, my overall opinion is uh, when they built this car back in the early 60s and, and prior to that, um, the engineering that was put into this car, the quality of materials, the design, the fit and finish, everything they did uh, was done to the highest level of quality uh, imaginable. There wasn't anything I've seen anywhere here where, oh, you could cut a little corner here, you could trim this off, you could skinny this down. Nowadays, the mentality is uh, if there's a cheaper way to do it or a quicker way to do it, just do it that way. But uh, in these days, this car was done uh, with the mentality, uh, what's the best possible way and the best possible outcome, the best possible finish we can build? And that's what they built. Really, really impressive. Looking at our driver's side here, so a close look at our gauges. So these green gauges, uh, 67 would have been the last year for those. In 68, they changed colors of the face. Um, and then also our steering wheel here. Uh, this one I'm going to be using for uh, Concours situations only. I won't actually be using this as I drive it around town. I have a new replacement Momo uh, prototypa that's going to look really cool in here. I got it with a silver finish. I thought the idea would be to uh, mimic our trim on the dashboard and kind of tie the two looks together. And then looking at our door threshold, how that finishes out. And there was a couple of different versions of thresholds they used on these cars. And then looking at the back here, so this is always a problem guys. I just don't have any room in this booth here to really get back and uh, show you the car. So we just kind of have to do the best we can. But uh, I've got the back end pulled out here. And so what's going to happen when I bring the engine in here, I'm going to try something um, a little bit different to install this engine. Go about it uh, in a slightly different way and hopefully uh, take some of the work out of it for a DIY guy who doesn't have a lift. Um, I don't know if it'll work, but we'll give it a try and see what happens. Uh, I'll know more as we roll the engine in here exactly how far I can take that. And then a uh, full front look here. So now we have all our panels adjusted where we need them. You can see I've added the uh, Porsche stripes in our final finish molding. And uh, I want to point out here, you can see a couple bubbles in the, uh, the decals there. So uh, yeah, I've been wrestling with these guys for about three weeks now. And uh, the bubble situation actually is improving. They're coming out and uh, it is tightening up the way I want it. 
and uh, I've tried everything. I've tried squeegees, uh, credit cards, um, heat, I've taken it outside in the sun. Uh, and the best thing I found to work these bubbles out is just time and taking it out in the, uh, the warm sun for a couple hours a day. So I cover the car up and just leave the stripes exposed and uh, slowly, slowly they're dissipating. So if you're putting these decals on um, and you're having some problems with bubbles, as you can see there, um, they probably will work themselves out. But I'll keep you posted on that. If they don't work themselves out, then I'll have to redo these stripes. Um, this particular stripe here is uh, from Porsche, and it's a peel and stick type application. It's not uh, water solvent in a squeegee type. So um, I have a tendency to think that it's going to work out. The passenger side is almost flat. I've got like one bubble left, and uh, we should be in pretty good shape there. And then also our uh, side molding put in place there. It really finishes it off. Gives it a nice finished look. And then looking through our windscreen down onto our dashboard. Quite a bit of glare in here, guys. So uh, hopefully one day we'll get this thing out of here and get some nice video on it outside. Um, so here's our final panel gaps, or close to our final panel gaps. Uh, real happy with the way everything turned out. But an incredible wrestling match, I'm telling you. These things just beat me to death. It's just an unbelievable amount of work to get everything lined up and to work out. Okay, so let's take a look at panel gaps then and see exactly uh, what the manual says and the tooling I'm using to adjust everything. So you can pause here at any point. Um, these are pages from the manual regarding door gaps and uh, various panel gaps, be it fender, hood, or uh, engine lid. Hopefully you can pause this and get something out of it. But basically, uh, most of the gaps are between three and four millimeters. Um, and they do speak about uh, occasionally setting something up at five millimeters or so less. You can use any kind of a gauge really to check your panel gaps and do your adjusting. Um, you could use plastic or wood or something soft so you don't hurt the paint. So I made these up with masking tape and set it with a uh, dial indicator. So I've got a three millimeter and a four millimeter gauge and a straight edge and that's basically what you're going to need to set everything. Okay, let's see if I can explain these panel gaps in a uh, simple and easy to understand fashion. It would take me hours, literally, to explain all the things uh, that relate to these gaps. But basically, I gave you the the, uh, the outline of how I did it. Um, you got to move everything in a position first, and then once you have everything uh, aligned with each other, then you can start tweaking the panel gaps. So our back gap here, this one's not going anywhere. You can see a four millimeter won't go in, but a three millimeter will go in. So um, I'm just using these as a gauge to work the gaps all the way around. And so the same thing up here, Porsche is specking out uh, near the top here. Uh, this would be a four millimeter type situation. All right, so we can get four millimeters in here. And this uh, radius area here, this is an area on the car um, that's unique to the car. So not all these look the same on every Porsche. They're all hand built and hand dialed in. So what looks like a proper fit on one may not be a proper fit on another one. So you just kind of have to do the best you can. But uh, in the manual, they're saying four millimeters approximately up here. And then on the front here, this is all going to be three millimeters. Okay, so I've got three millimeters. I can just barely get it in there, but I can't get in my four millimeter. It's just too tight. It's not going to go. So that's how tight the panel gaps are. So if you've got a lot of paint, a lot of primer uh, on your body work, you're going to have some issues with it. So probably the most critical adjustment in your gaps are going to be uh, with these shims used behind the base plate of your door to jam location. So you can make up uh, various thicknesses depending on what's needed. I haven't used a plastic one, but you could use plastic. I wouldn't use cardboard because it could get wet. Um, the thick one here was uh, one that came with the car originally from Porsche and I didn't reuse it. And then this one here I made up. Um, and I've got a couple of these placed. I don't remember where they are, but um, you'll have to play with them many times. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to set the jam, the front of the jam, to whatever is going to work out on the back of the jam. So you, so you got to shim that out 
until you have your three millimeters back here. Okay, so once you got your door in basic location and your uh, rear jam set to approximately three millimeters, you can then move on to the fenders. So the fenders will then have to be adjusted into the front of your door, right up here. So those two kind of marry together in a way uh, where the door will open without rubbing. Um, you're going to have to have the right height across here. You need to be fairly flush up there. And uh, right in this area here, those two got to work together until you've got something that'll work. So when you're flush here and you're flush here, your bottom gap uh, down here to the rocker panel will be right at about three millimeters. So not a lot of room for forgiveness there. And then your gas cap, I would just take whatever that is and make it equal all the way around. And then the hood here, this is the real problem right here. So what they're talking about in the manual for a hood, right up here in the fascia, uh, between four and five millimeters in the rear there, and four millimeters on the side. I'm a little bit tight. I do need to move that over to the passenger side a little bit. And I haven't moved it because I have to pull this hood. So why do I have to pull this hood? So here's the straight edge here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get uh, even. We're trying to get as even as we can. Okay, so we're just a little bit high here, which I could live with. Uh, but any more than that, I wouldn't be able to live with it. We're pretty good here. So if anything, it could come down a little bit on this side. But on this side, uh, this is a real problem over here. So I fought this fender and this door and everything going on with it. Uh, for days trying to get it worked out. I finally got it to where I like it and very happy with the way uh, the end result is. And I looked back at some of my uh, earlier videos and I could tell uh, the factory, they also had a problem with this fender and this door, also uh, following some of the evidence of uh, how they tried to adjust it at the factory. So we're a little bit high here, if anything. Fender to jam. Uh, not much, but just a little bit. But from the original setting, this fender was quite high here. We were really quite high in relation to our balance. Um, so what does that do with the hood? So if this fender is higher than our hood, so then our plane here will, will work out. But you can see now, I really am too high with the hood there. And I'm definitely too high right here. So that hood has got to go down. The only way I'm going to be able to get that hood to go down is to pull the hood off, I'm going to have to remove the inner hinge plate that mounts to the body, open up the holes, and lower it down, and then reinstall the hood. There is no way I can get any more adjustment out of it, because right now, in this position, uh, that hinge plate is maxed out on its downward adjustment. So if I want to be that particular, that's what I'm going to have to do to get it to work. So while I got it off, I'm going to open up both sides and see if I can get this uh, a little bit more right. Uh, our right-hand side looks pretty good, very acceptable, uh, but our left-hand side over here uh, it's still got a little bit of work to do, and I need to get that hood lowered in that back corner. And then looking at our engine lid, so what do we do here to get things to work out? What I'm trying to do here is get the, uh, the tail of the lid as flush as I can with the fender there and line those up first. I've seen some cars where this is hanging down quite a bit and uh, I can see where that is possible because uh, it's really really difficult to get everything up here to work out. So what they want uh, in the manual as you'll see in those pages is between four and five millimeters up here. You can barely get four in there. Um, anything less than that and you're going to be rubbing paint right there. You won't get it open. And then three millimeters on the side, right about there. So real, real tight with Porsche, uh, and not a lot of room for forgiveness. Okay, let's go over our choline fuel line issue. So we have a viewer, Ron from Australia, and uh, Ron had reached out and uh, sent me a link to some of the updated information. Uh, guys are having issues with these uh, choline fuel lines. So we want to thank Ron for that. So anyways, I'm going to put a link below uh, of that thread. You guys can check it out and uh, 
and just kind of uh, do what you think you need to do there to protect yourself and your investment. So I'm real big on originality. I like to see all the original uh, ferrules and uh, fittings and, and uh, braided hose. But when it comes to safety, uh, yeah, it's just not really worth taking a chance here. And I think even in a concourse situation, um, they give you some, some room on uh, fuel and brake system. So if you're not completely original, there is some forgiveness there. Uh, so you don't actually have to be 100% original, only in your own mind. If you have a fire or an accident here, um, it's just not going to be worth it. Uh, there's a whole lot of work here. You could, uh, you could end up getting injured. And it's quite an investment here uh, to be playing with. So in regards to the uh, latest information coming in on choline, and they're not really standing behind the product here, uh, I'm going to switch all this out to uh, high-pressure fuel injection hose. That's really going to be your safest bet. Uh, the permeation from modern fuels through any kind of rubber hose line, uh, it's just so caustic. I mean, it'll permeate virtually anything. I had a uh, 2001 Ford Lightning pickup once. Uh, yeah, great truck. I really just loved that truck. After 11 years, I had check engine light that I just couldn't cure. Uh, had something to do with fuel system. Um, anyways, by poking around underneath the truck and through the truck, the high pressure fuel injection hose, which is way stronger and way tougher than anything we got in here, uh, the fuel literally permeated right through the line from front to back on that truck. It ate the whole thing up. You could touch it with your finger and uh, chalk would just come off. So uh, the fuel is just nasty. It'll permeate everything. So I think your best bet here is to switch everything to high pressure fuel injection line. I have that on my Tiger and I replace that every five years whether it needs it or not just to stay updated and fresh. So uh, that's an FYI on your choline fuel line. And then just kind of a fun thing here before we wrap up. So here's your uh, printouts of all your panel gaps. You can pause those and uh, look through those. And this is the uh, manual set that I've used to restore this car. Uh, real nice volume one and two, really manual set. And uh, this is our latest uh, addition for the car. When I have some time, I'll get that installed. Just kind of a fun thing. Uh, we can always be original, but uh, we can also have some fun. Okay guys, so there she is, five and a half years in the making. Uh, I gotta tell you, I've taken the time in the beginning. I had no idea it would be this tough, this difficult, and this much work to get this car uh, where I wanted to get it. So my hat's off to the guys who do this professionally, uh, how they can handle this on a day-to-day -day basis and get all these issues worked out. We have a really high quality restoration. My hat's off to you guys. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.